Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, welcome. I'm David Cowan, president of the museum. And thank you. Uh, more importantly, welcome to the museum that John Herzog founded. Now, congratulations to John on the book. Uh, I have read it and really enjoyed it on three different levels. Uh, first, as an economic historian and the history of a firm, it's very interesting. Secondly, as a legacy to his family. And third, it provides insights to John that I have now learned. Uh, the book will be on sale after. He'd be happy to autograph it for you. I see some of you got your autographs in beforehand. <clears throat> now, after reading the book, one takeaway that I have comes from the uh, appendix, um, which is that it's not just uh, a billion to one, but in another sense, it is very much one to a billion, because if you aggregate all the trades that uh, HHG did over the years, you'll see that it comes very close to a billion, which is quite an amazing, amazing feat. It is my pleasure to introduce John Herzog, the founder of the Museum of American Finance. Let me just adjust this business here. And you can hear me, right? And uh, thank you all for coming. What a nice thing for me to see all your smiling faces. And I hope that it, you'll look that way when I have finished. <laughs> we are here on October 20th, one day after the 30th anniversary of the crash of 1987. So all the things that you have read about the crash, about, uh, about the things that were happening in trading rooms across the country, all that is true. And in our trading room, uh, the traders were exhausted physically and in addition to that, they had the strain of the emotional and psychological result of terrific losses in their trading accounts. Nobody knew which end was up. When I went to uh, Diana's office after we finished with the day, she looked at me and she said, you know, you don't look like a guy that wants to go out for a, a spiffy meal at the Quilted Giraffe, which was one of the great restaurants of those days. And I said, no, I don't. It, I had made the reservation months before. And Diana said, well, don't worry, I'll call them. So she gets on the phone, a voice answers, and she says, you know, I'm so sorry, but my husband is in the finance business, and today has been a terrible day. I must cancel our reservation. I'm so sorry. And the voice on the other end of the phone says, don't worry, lady, all our reservations were canceled. <laughs> well, that's the, way, that's the way the crash started, that experience, because October 19th is also our wedding anniversary. And Last, yesterday would have been number 54. So that was, that was pretty interesting. And it, uh, we had only a few months before consummated a deal with an institutional investor to lend the firm serious subordinated money. And I thought, this guy must be very unhappy. And I called him up, and I said, look, you know, you don't have to worry. We had a terrible day. However, we are in good shape. We know where we are, and we are not worried, and we don't want you to worry. And a couple of weeks later, he thanked me for calling. And he said, you know, you're the only firm that called me that we have debts out to. You're the only firm that called to say, don't worry. And when he visited the museum in 2007, he reminded me of that call. And that's the way that we tried to do business. We wanted our customers to feel wonderful. And we did everything we could 
to try to accomplish that. So why did this book come into existence in the first place? And I have my master's degree from NYU, and my master's thesis had been a managerial critique of the firm for the first 40 years in business, 1926 to 1960. And I was out with some friends. They had begun a business. The business was successful. They were both Harvard graduates, and they said to Harvard, why don't you come down, look at our firm, and use it as a case study? And Harvard came, they looked, and they said, yes. And I said, that's terrific, because Harvard asked me for a copy of my master's thesis for their entrepreneurial history uh, collection. They couldn't believe that. They said, you, ha you wrote such a thing? We have to read it. So instead of making Xerox copies, I digitized my master's thesis. I realized that I could add to it things that I had not known when I handed in my thesis. And then I realized that I could add stuff that happened later and that developed into the book idea. When we liquidated the offices a few blocks from here, I had 12 boxes of my papers from my files, all hig higgledy-piggledy. And I hired a college intern in the summer five years ago gave her all the boxes. And at the end of the summer, she had taken each piece of paper out, looked at it, and arranged all those papers in chronological order. That gave me a skeleton from which to get the information that I had forgotten. Forty years had passed, and I, ha I realized that I had forgotten lots of things that I had done, which were important, but you know, they went right out of my mind, and having this reference with me was a wonderful help. When I joined my father in 1959, I had spent two years previously after college at Cornell with uh, Eastman Dillon Union Securities. Is there anybody here who remembers that name? Oh, wonderful. Anyway, it was a great firm, and uh, they, I was in the Philadelphia office. I had said goodbye. I came to New York. I said to my father, I don't know what I'm going to do next. He very quietly opened the drawer of his desk like this, and he took out a little piece of paper, and he handed it to me, saying, well, Sonny, you could always join the firm, the, the family firm. And it was an engraved business card with my name and the firm name. So what do you say to your father? OK, Dad, you know, here I am, without knowing anything about his business. There were four people in the firm at that time. I was employee number five. I was paid $50 a week and one half of anything I could produce, which amounted to very little. And I started out. The average age of the firm after I joined was 65. And there we were writing four transactions each day. Now, for those of you who can remember how you felt when you were 23, just think, you know, I just joined this company. They write four pieces of business every day that takes about uh, five minutes to do them all. And what do you do for the rest of the work day? And you aren't making any money, and you don't know anything about the business. Wow. So I spent a lot of time looking at the ceiling. And then we figured out how to begin doing more business. 
Well, in one of my summer times with my father, I had found a few old stock certificates in a closet. And I did the research to discover whether those stock certificates still had any value. And I found at the end of a summer's work on this was so tedious, you can't believe, writing to secretaries of state and so on. Uh, and at the end of the summer, I found one share of stock, Anglo Lotoro Nitrate, that was worth $8. And my father and I went hand in hand down the street to 120 to redeem that one share of stock. And that was a terrific moment for me. I realized that knowing how to do that research, I could do the research for anybody that asked me. So then I thought, well, I have to get some people to ask me. That developed into a business. I charged $3.50 to do that research. And that was big money in those days, I thought, although nobody asked me. Very few people asked me. But over time, the inquiries grew. And I also studied the tax law. And I learned that if you're a stockholder and you own a stock which has become worthless, you would like to take a tax loss on your investment. You can't do that if the that company became worthless in a year other than the tax return you are filing. The rules are pretty harsh. I had been a collector of old stock certificates by this time. I had a few in my collection. I knew that there were other people who were looking f for them. And I got the idea to say to all those people, I will buy anything that you want to sell. So I had a little form. I charged $10 to make the transaction. I bought whatever they had, a dollar for the lot, and people began to send me stuff. So I was ahead by $9 plus the certificates. The certificates could be sold to the collector's market. I, I, was, I thought I was on easy street. And as time went by, people came and called and sold anything they wanted to sell. And in a little while, I had several pages of single line entries of corporations, but they were not actually all worthless. There were corporations in there that were just sleeping. And every once in a while, one of those names would pop. And that was very profitable business. And so we began to get more inquiries. And we thought, you know, how can we continue to get more inquiries? And by this time, the, the young men who got to Wall Street at about the same time wanted to get to know each other. And so among those people, Erwin uh, Goodell, who was working downtown at another firm, came and said, you know, let's, uh, let's meet. So I never wanted to go out for a drink after work because I had had much too much to drink at Cornell. I was finished with that. Erwin was very happy to come and talk with me on long walks up to Greenwich Village, where I was living. And we talked about this and that and how to do business. Pretty soon, he joined the firm. Right behind him was his younger brother, Buzzy. Buzzy had been following the market for years, always wanted to learn to trade. So there was his his big brother there trading. And Buzzy came along and started to get lessons from Irwin. And pretty soon, Buzzy was able to make trades. So he chose, as a specialty, he chose the new issue market. At that time, a firm called A.P. Montgomery was doing most of the new issue business. 
And in the first several days of a new issue, the markets were very erratic and the spreads were very wide. So it was hard to make the right transactions for your clients. Buzzy saw that as an opportunity and he began to trade all the IPOs that he could. And I can tell you that at the, in the beginning, that was frightening for the rest of us. Sell this, buy that, get, get over there, go, jump, 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 jump. And we couldn't keep up with what he was doing, but he did it and he learned how to do it properly. And pretty soon, we were getting a nice call in the new issue business. Then we still had the problem of how to get more calls because in the trading business, what you want to do is get inquiries. You need people to call you up and ask you for your market. A guy from the telephone company came to the office one day and he was going to speak to some phone problem that we had. And he takes out his pencil and he was making some notes and I saw that this pencil had a very funny thing on the end of it. It had a, a little ball. And I said, w what the heck is that for? And he tells me, well, you know, you're using a rotary phone. You have to do that all the time. And that's exactly right. I said, what's the name of the manufacturer of that object? We sent out 7,000 pencils all over America to trading desks with our name and phone number, and the people loved them. It was my responsibility to p make those packages. So I would put a dozen pencils in a, in a package and send it to a trading desk out there. Monday morning, the phone would ring, and the guy said to me, you know, you told me you were going to send me a dozen pencils. There were only four pencils in the box. <laughs> I was clapping. I knew we had hit the jackpot with these pencils. People loved them. The calls came in, and we did more and more business. We realized that things were happening in the business that we were in, making markets in over-the-counter stuff. <laughs>